Yeah. Well, as we've done with the previous sessions, <clears throat> we'll open it for questions and comments. Our intent was to be <clears throat> sufficiently entertaining, uh, provocative, uh, <laughs> non-standard in our view of the things that eMERGE has done. And I, I hope you agree we've succeeded uh, with our uh, soiree of, of presentations. So we're interested in uh, input from anyone who would like to contribute. Sharon. Well, to, to start off, I'll ask a question of Matt from what he talked about at the very end, which is, do you have a sense of how many communities are out there? So an example I've given before, so I apologize if people have heard it. I'm a type 1 diabetic. There's actually an entire group of parents that first figured out how to monitor their children's blood sugars, develop MongoDB databases, all done free and with just helping each other. And it's really only been in the last year that I know University of Michigan now has a grant to, we can give permission to share our data. But so like the academic piece came much later than this whole technology. And I just don't know, is, is Facebook willing to share that kind of information? Do we have some sense of how many such communities may have germinated on their own and are out there that might be willing to partner? Yes, that's a good question. So I don't know, I, I don't think anybody's ever done a census of all of these new communities that have popped up. Um, I, I would estimate that there are thousands of them already, uh, which are often, you know, the my gene name community. Um, you know, they, they just, and, and, and the reason they pop up is because, you know, the first one usually creates a Facebook group or a Google group or something like that. And then they're suddenly they're searchable. They can be found by other patients very quickly that way. Um, the, actually, it's, what's interesting is there's often now multiple communities per gene. Yeah, and I, I suspect there's probably for every disease multiple communities now, and uh, even multiple nonprofit foundations, no matter how few patients there are. Um, so I, I, I suspect, having not talked to Facebook, that they would be willing uh, in some way to, to partner with, uh, with, with academic researchers and, and enable you know, better support for these communities. And I think there's a lot that you could do, actually, if Facebook were willing to actually provide customized support for these, you know, these medical communities. They, certainly, they could provide, provide them much more fine-grained control over the privacy of that group. You know, right now, uh, I don't know that the, the, some people are sort of hesitant to join these groups just out of the privacy concerns. Some people might not want their membership to be visible to the outside world, for instance. So even simple things like that would make it much easier for these communities to, to form and sustain. Uh, thank you. Uh, clearly, a central question is the role of the physician and the physician-patient relationship as these new data models evolve. And I wonder what the opportunities are for this program in the future to have uh, novel components that look for novel ways for those relationships to evolve whilst avoiding the bottleneck on uh, research and discovery that the current models uh, give rise to. So I, I'm stating the obvious once more, but I feel like we're acknowledging this implicitly as an issue, but not stepping up and saying, well, what could this group do to change that relationship in a productive way in the, in the wake of new data models? So I invite to comment, please. Uh, well, I think that um, that's a huge problem. As I said, physicians are in favor of genomic medicine, but their experiences so far may have not been optimal. And we have to create these tools. And I think the electronic health record is a, is a tremendous uh, potential uh, means of uh, implementing genomic medicine in a way that doesn't pose a burden to physicians. And tools such as genomic decision aids, uh, um, appropriate uh, clinical decision support, knowledge resources within the EHR will all be very important in that regard. And more so over, uh, app, as we continue to develop these apps or app-based uh, modules for certain disorders, that'd be really helpful. And uh, I think it will also depend on where you're practicing. If you're a family medicine or a family practitioner, maybe there's a different level uh, of, uh, you know, tools or genomic educational literacy that, that you're expected to have versus a specialist such as a cardiologist who is dealing with uh, certain heritable disorders. So I think it's an ongoing um, area of work, and we certainly need to engage and seek um, feedback from physicians in this regard, as, not rather than designing tools and then saying, here it is for if, you. If I may jump in very quickly. So that's a physician-centric answer, and we have a unique opportunity. You're next to someone who might give a patient-centric answer. And I wonder if we can concentrate, uh, uh, contrast those two. 
So, so perhaps yeah, if it I could be. I also jump in. Okay, go ahead. Heidi. Um, so I, I was going to also give a patient-centric answer. You know, I think one of the challenges with a lot of these patient organizations is they are very strong advocates for their communities, um, and harnessing that kind of energy and motivation is incredibly valuable. But they, they certainly don't want nor need to reinvent the wheel in terms of how do they capture genetic data from their, you know, constituencies, how do they... Um, gather phenotypic data in structured ways. And so I think um, if we can partner with them and provide them some of the tools, and we've been trying in ClinGen to do this on the structured genetic data collection side by providing our Genome Connect patient registry where they can just upload a scan copy of their PDF report, and then we capture all the genetic data off of that for them, working with them to connect lay community terminologies for phenotype data, but but us providing that linkage to ontology systems so it can be a standardized in terms of phenotype capture. So these are just two examples, but I think there's many ways that we can partner with those patient communities, provide them some consistency in tools and standards, and then allow them to be more advanced and more capturing of the rich amount of data and information from their groups. And perhaps the general statement of that is to say that to date, eMERGE has used very traditional channels and very traditional reporting relationships and very traditional kind of paternalistic healthcare. But isn't it uh, obviously well positioned to do some alternative way of providing sources of information and then measure the measure the impact of doing it? Because it's not a it's not a solved problem. It's an interesting research question in its own right. Oh, wow, a whole hand, bunch of hands went up, and I think yours went up first, and we'll go around the table. I, I'd like to ask uh, <laughs> uh, Matt Might about uh, the opportunity that the social media and the, uh, the new ways of relating to each other give us an opportunity to find family history data in these uh, social media communities. I think that's a really important problem that we haven't uh, conquered, is to be able to uh, benefit the patients and the pedigrees with these uh, genes percolating through these uh, families in ways that we we don't appreciate, you know, both from the phenotype to genotype perspective and from the opportunity to organize and to deal with the, the uh, privacy issues and the other issues that inhibit our ability to be able to get at pedigrees. Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I think there's already opportunities with the tools that exist right now to start getting better pedigrees. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, you are... I, I do know examples of cases in the rare disease communities where in the event of a diagnosis, uh, the families will sign up for, say, 23andMe and use that to search for other relatives that they were unaware of. Um, and, I mean, there, there's cases where this, this is, you know, it can actually be quite useful. Uh, you know, so there's, there's also a case I'm working on at UAB where we want to find a, a variant, but we don't have quite enough family members. So we're going to try to find more using 23andMe to see if we can see if, if there are others that are out there. Uh, this is the case where the... The family was immigrants not too far back, and so we think there, there have to be other relatives affected by this very unique condition, so can we find them this way? Um, so I think you know, these sort of like you know, hybrid genomic social media tools are already proving quite useful for uh, flushing out pedigrees. It certainly will become more so over time, I imagine. Uh, Marilyn, did you have yours? Yeah, I was going to address the comment that you just made, Dan. Um, as I was sitting here listening to Stephanie earlier, and you made a couple of comments, and when, when you just said what you said, it triggered that it's almost as though Emerge is the R&D engine behind something like the All of Us program. So because we're so much smaller in scope and complexity, we could do things like collect some of the data that Iftikhar talked about. So we could start to do surveys of Emerge participants to link with their longitudinal EHR data. We could do other omics. We could, and we are starting to bring in, bring in environmental data from geocoding. But maybe another opportunity is looking for the interactions of our genome with all of these other sources of data in the patterns of our kind of disease trajectories of the patient populations that we're working with. And we could try lots of different types of things that in some ways are kind of pilots that all of us could do some of kind of small shoot-off pilots, but the whole program couldn't possibly 
test all of those things because somebody earlier said it's like the large ship versus like the smaller ships. So I forget the exact analogy. Um, but I think there is an opportunity here. We have really rich clinical data and we already have a lot of genomic data. We've done kind of all the standard GWAS, FIWAS things that are kind of the out of the box vanilla things to do. There's a lot of other data we could get from our patients that would enrich the data that we have. Maybe some of those things would explain the reduced penetrance. So maybe it's interactions with other genes, interactions with the environment, some other methylation change or transcriptome change that explains that reduced penetrance. And we might be able to actually assess that in the data that we have. Uh, and Rex, who had the nautical metaphor in the first uh, Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it, it, we, I, I won't revisit that. Um, although I've had conversations offline with several people about that analogy, which I still like. But, um, I, you know, just to build on that a little bit, because I, I think it's interesting, I, I, you know, Matt's comment that uh, uh, six of the public equal one PhD. I'm surprised the number's so large. But, um, you, you know, it does raise the question of things that are difficult to scale, like clinical annotation decisions and some of these others, you know, and I, I know ClinGen's thought about it. You know, Eric talked about crowd, cloud sourcing. Um, you know, I, I think we are really well positioned maybe to think about doing some of those kinds of experiments in, in Emerge. And, and I think the key is we've got a gold standard you can compare it to. What do you, I mean, whether it's the right gold standard, we can debate a lot, but the gold standard is what we can get out of electronic health records. But if we were really able to throw a whole bunch of new uh, patients thinking about it in a different way at the problem, what would that data, what would that look like and could we get a more efficient approach? And, and I don't know, I mean, Matt, maybe you've got the most experience with that, but you know, it seems to me that's an experiment that would be very interesting and fun to try. Yeah, I always enjoy these discussions about disruptive opportunities, but it always raises the philo philosophical issue that one of the inherent properties of disruption is it's unanticipated, and the, which raises then the second question, which is, are we likely to be the ones that are disrupted, which I think is more likely than be the disruptors, because we're essentially trying to disrupt with, from within, which has not been a successful um, uh, uh, enterprise over time, with a few notable exceptions, perhaps. Um, the point of this is, um, I think the things that are beginning, you know, to resonate in terms of what Emerge can do is to think about it more as, you know, the, the skunk works, where we could try some interesting ideas um, that, you know, would potentially uh, be orthogonal to the way we traditionally do things and, could, and within small pilots might be able to demonstrate value in a way that we um, haven't been able to do. Because all of the things that we've heard today about, well, we can't get the clinicians to follow the CDS rules, or we can't get them to buy into the evidence. Or I mean, these are recurring themes that we will continue to, uh, to come up against unless we can somehow end run it uh, and, and make it happen. And I think the patient is a, is a great opportunity there. Now, PCORI has tried to do this with the PCORnet, where, uh, and particularly the patient-powered research networks. I don't know that there's a lot to show that, you know, when you put patients into what is a very... Um, uh, rigid and in some ways ossified uh, system that they can affect much change. Um, and in fact, probably there's more risk of Stockholm syndrome than anything else. Um, you know, so how could, how could Emerge empower or partner with patients in a way to really do something that's, that's truly innovative? And that's why I'm, I'm really glad that Matt is here and that Matt is also in the position that he's in, at, because I think it gives us some opportunities to really explore that and thinking about how that might be able to come across. I, I must admit to some skepticism that, you know, come, as much as we say in review that innovation is one of the scoring elements for uh, 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 proposals, um, there's, in study section, there's a lot of concern about innovation. Uh, and, and there's a lot of concern that if you don't have data, uh, that this is really not something that we can really risk. Uh, we're risk averse. And so all of these things, all these tensions, uh, make it very challenging to uh, to think about how within an extant system how we could actually do something that would be really innovative. Yeah, I think one of the solutions uh, to some of the problems that Mark's been bringing up and, and others have is uh, have a, every time a clinician successfully deploys 
uh, appropriately one of the, the eMERGE tactics. Uh, they get an automated health grade and Yelp post uh, so that they can you know, kind of counteract all the other stuff that's there. Um, the, the, the other group that, the group that I was going to mention kind of got alluded to as well is that you know, right now um, places like Walmart, uh, CVS, uh, b before the insurance uh, purchase, uh, Walgreens are, are trying to do more and more of uh, primary care type activities, trying to be more than a dock in the box uh, urgent care place, trying to be less than a traditional primary care. Those are places where um, there's a growing segment. It's still a minority of people going there. Um, but, um, and who knows if anyone will have health care in a few months, maybe they will all be going there. But um, the idea that we could be reaching out to those places now um, before it's too crowded um, would be also linked in with some of the other suggestions at Facebook, Google, um, Amazon, um, a uh, close flight from your home um, is um, is pushing into healthcare dramatically. Um, there, you know, there are places that are going to be, like Mark said, we are probably going to be disrupted, so we should be thinking ahead. So uh, you know, I would, I, um, I you know, I would say that that uh, emerge has been a bit disruptive. Um, so um, I mean, I I think that just in thinking about the various communities, twenty three andme has told us that you can actually get valuable information from people. No, no HR connected to it. You publish 80 papers, and, and, and you know, some of that data is very valuable. It can be a starting point for research. Emerge has, has, I think, been disruptive in saying health data is useful, and we can figure out how, in the first time, you get a bunch of people with disparate healthcare systems to act together. Um, there's also been one other area, maybe you know, Eric or the other data commons people can talk about, that I think is going to be necessary as we start bringing together uh, what Emerge has done is brought together a research community and actually tried to link it with an implementation, the clinical community. And the, the, the um, you know, I think all of us is going to be sort of the, 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 really the innovator in really adding to that, to, uh, in, at, to the data that comes from the, the, um, the users. But it, all these separate, all these communities are, are, have traditionally worked separately. And one of the things I think that we have, that are in, in a disruptive area of innovation, where some work's been done in Emerge and others is, is Finding a place or a space where all of these um, disruptive uh, contributors, as well as the carrier class entities, Kaduri, UK Biobank, MVP, all of us, um, can come and, and play together in the same sandbox to create the, the, um, the knowledge base to, for um, the, the implementation. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, Matt could comment on how to do this in a secure way that makes all the different users happy. And, puts the right boundaries around everything. I think you, I think Emerge has solved some of those problems and that I think could, could be very, very useful in maybe pushing the federal government to come together and, and create a space that would make that easier to happen. Josh. I just was reflecting on what you're saying, Mike, and, and just the theme of the all, all the discussions really all went through, you know, looped through the patient in some way. And you know, the novel kinds of information we can get there. I, I, I'm glad, Mike, that you thought that we've been disruptive. I, I think that, you know, I, I kind of feel like, you know, harkening back to Dan's first point that, that we have in some initial hypotheses. But, the, you know, I, I think what is that next step? And I actually think that there is an opportunity to leverage the strength of the connection to, you know, our primary strength of the connection to our healthcare systems. But then, you know, we brought in with the Emerge One the extra domain of, you know, genetic data in the kind of emerged three, especially and a little bit in two, we brought in the extra domains of, of you know, sort of uh, CLIA level genetic information. You know, I think in the next round, you know, sort of robustly diving into participant provided information and having them as, you know, sort of borrowing all of us language, you know, partners in the process, which can involve in sort of all that sort of rare variant phenotyping efforts. It could get into, you know, as we've promoted new methods, you know, 23andMe said, we could do cool things with patient-provided phenotypes. Well, maybe, you know, we can do cool things with patient and EHR-provided phenotypes and, you know, start asking interesting questions. I mean, one of the things I alluded to a little bit in, in, um, in our summary was this idea of a phenotype risk score, which, um, you know, is aggregating in sort of Mendelian patterns, but it could be any kind of pattern. We're using it um, uh, in the UDN now, you know, to test against rare variants. Um, and find uh, uh, sort of symptomatology at sensitivity levels beyond what you would in the, the typical EHR fashion. If we combine that with participant provided information from surveys, from you know these, you know from other kinds of things, leveraging that connection to the health network, 
maybe that would be sort of the next level, which you know foreshadows all of us kind of things too. A few years ahead of time. Despite what I hear is general enthusiasm, I guess I wanted to push back a little bit on the idea that <clears throat> Emerge would become the skunk works for PMI. You know, NHGRI is a relatively small institute. And the 21st Century Cures Act, I forgot the exact number, but the budget in that alone was four or five times the entire NHGRI budget. All of us. Yeah. But I just think that there's more to offer, first, the scientific community, and I think there's more to offer to NHGRI, and I think there's more questions that are NHGRI-focused than just becoming a pilot or an experimental sandbox for all of us. I, I think before I would go down that road, it, I, it seems the eMERGE investigators should think long and hard whether that's a healthy long-term road. Uh, but perhaps, we've heard a market basket full of interesting new ideas uh, throughout the day today, and it, it seems to me that there are natural alignments with other uh, major research efforts, and maybe it just falls in that category. You don't sort of do it as a subcontractor to all of us, but it turns out they have an interest and you have a native interest in well as well in a set of questions. So practically, perhaps uh, it's solved by natural alignments rather than unnatural alignments. But uh, I, I would maybe, uh, we're getting to this, the next session, which will be our summary and wrap up. So let me make sure I've got everybody whose hand, hand was up uh, for comments on this one. And those who are putting their hand up again. Sorry, what's <laughs> in know, response to what Eric said? Um, so it's a really good point, and I think um, remembering that this is NHGRI, so we have to keep the genome part in mind. So I like the idea of these other data sources, but specifically with the the context of trying to do more with the genome. So there are, I don't think what we necessarily want is a, a bigger sample size, more GWAS, you know, everybody always says more data is better, but we already have millions of GWAS, and we're getting to tens and hundreds of thousands of exomes and tens of thousands of genomes. And so it's not a matter of just more genomic data as much as can we capitalize on the genomics data and the richness of the EHR and add something else to it that others can't do. So a lot of the other cohorts don't have 20 years of electronic health record data that they can, can capitalize on to bring with the genomic data and maybe the wearable data or environmental data or family history data it seems like low-hanging fruit that theoretically should be easy, but we've yet to do well. Um, and so it, it seems like one that we should, should target because it would be so ripe with the EHR data and probably yield a lot of, of successful findings. Another question, Sharon? Uh, well, I was just to follow up. I, I have been a bit surprised that there's, been, although we've talked a lot about all of us, we really haven't talked about interacting with what used to be referred to as large-scale sequencing programs, but now have a different acronym, and I always forget what it is, <laughs> where they're you know, doing exomes on genomes or 25 or 50,000 individuals more for disease discovery, and I, I do think that's a group and a data set that I've been kind of surprised has not come up in these discussions that could be used to mine information or not. Um, I, the other point I was just going to make with regard to participant-based data submission, a lot of what people have been talking about is data submission. It's really a two-way two street. And I'll just give the example that in ClinGen, and I don't know if Heidi's still on the call, but our genome connect data set uh, registry, which a number of people around the room are involved with, patients can upload their DNA test reports uh, and give permission for that data to go into ClinVar. And very early on, it was identified that patients often don't have the most up-to-date classification of the variant. Um, and the laboratory may have classified the variant differently, and maybe their physician never caught There are many reasons they might not have it. But that's a good example where the committee then had to decide, well, how do we let our participants know that, in fact, the public database has an updated classification of that variant? So it's just an example where if you're getting data from participants, then you're interacting with participants, and they need to know about your results 
as well as just being a one-way communication path. Uh, Casey, and then. So I just uh, had one comment about, um, since we've been talking about all of us and eMERGE and the relationship between the two. Um, for eMERGE, my understanding is since we have biobanks, this is more, uh, the biobanks are more reflective of the population. And so I'm wondering if there are distinctions in the kinds of questions that we might ask in uh, a, a population, a, a, a resource that reflects a population if we're able to get phenotypes for all of those patients based uh, compared to um, a population where uh, there's volunteers that are donating their data for research. So it's just kind of a general question. Maybe I can just respond to that. So I, I think there is an opportunity there because, you know, one of the things we all know about electronic health records data, even though we've said multiple times today how we've demonstrated that it's great for use for research purposes, it is still incomplete and wholly with an H uh, data. And so, you know, I, I wonder if there's an opportunity for the participants to help fill in some of that missing phenotype data uh, through participant provided information. And that seems to me where there would be a real opportunity if we had, you know, a collection of participants that had genetic variants that we knew about and our HR data we know to be incomplete. If there's an opportunity for them to provide some additional context, maybe where we got started today, um, to that data, that might go a long way to help us actually figure out why, you know, some of the issues related to penetrance or related to uh, why things uh, are seen in one patient and not another. So I think there is a real opportunity there for the participants to help complete a data set that we know to be incomplete. Yeah, so to, is this on? Yeah, so can I just respond to that? So as Matt kind of um, alluded to some of the Monarch Initiative and the layperson phenotyping, so we have, I have a, a PCORI grant to develop and refine two patient cell phenotyping methods. So one with Genome Connect and one <clears throat> using the layperson term. And those would be available, we're setting them up to be available as an app. You know, so patients could go, I'm just saying that going forward, hopefully we will have some of that type of thing. Just for the reason you're saying is because the electronic medical record just doesn't give you everything. And patients really know, ask Matt, I mean, this came probably from him. They know better about their phenotype than we do. So I'm just saying that we are developing some of those tools. I'd like to respond to the, um, I guess, the penetrance question, and with one of the ideas being to throw more, throw more data at this to find G by E and, epi and epigenetic interactions. And I think that's great and that's true. Um, but I think another reason we're not seeing a lot of the penetrance is a lot of those interactions you, you're only going to see because they're ep actually epistatic interactions. And right, so um, in epi in epistatic sweeps, one of the problems is they don't scale well with traditional methods. And we've looked at this um, with a single phenotype and a population with 28 million SNPs. It would take 240 million hours, CPU hours, to do a single 2D sweep of the genome. All right, And um, sitting in a supercomputing environment, we can actually do that for one phenotype, but we want to do it for 100,000 phenotypes. Um, and so that doesn't work. But the good news is we are working on, on machine and deep learning methods that, that do all of a sudden make epistasis scalable um, by f a five orders of magnitude increase in speed. So all of a sudden we can not just do 2D sweeps, we can do fourth and fifth and sixth order sweeps of entire genomes and discover a signal that we're completely missing with single QTL mapping. Um, and so I think, you know, G by E, certainly, things to go after. Other data sets, certainly, things to go after. But we also need to think systemically about many of these interesting complex phenotypes are due to heterogeneous collections of genome variants that are working collectively to, to lead to these complex phenotypes. And we can all, we can all list um, long, long collections of interesting complex phenotypes that are not going to be super amenable to, to simple QTL mapping and understanding the entire story. Um, but there is good algorithmic development that combined with supercomputing capacity that we have within DOE, um, we can actually approach these problems in a way that we've never been able to before. And that's, that's literally proving out as we speak now. <laughs> yes. Um, 
since we've talked about patient reported uh, information, I think we'd be remiss, and I think Matt did allude to this, but I wanted to come back to it and be explicit. Um, that as we think about outcomes, we should capture patient reported outcomes. There are standardized measures for that, the promise measures. My guess is that if we examine those, uh, there may be gaps related to uh, promise measures for genomic medicine, which would be something that I think eMERGE would be well suited to, uh, to deal with and then uh, test the implementation of those. So I think that would close the loop for involving patients in a project of this nature. Yes. I just also wanted to respond about the patient engagement. Um, I'm sure many of you remember in Emerge One, we did a lot of patient engagement. Those many of the participants we were engaging were from our biobanks, and many of us still continue to have relationships with our biobank populations, who are most of the people who are genotyped in Emerge. And so I think we have a lot of relationships that we can build on um, and bring them in as partners maybe again into Emerge and to some of the things that we're thinking about and also ask them what they want, um, what would help them in understanding their genome and understanding the information because I think those are many of the things that all of us is trying to do and I, I feel like we've sort of skipped over that a little bit and have taken the attitude of, you know, we're re a, a very medical sort of top-down approach and um, I think a lot of these ideas are focusing on what patients want and how they can work with us as partners in research. And I think that um, we have a lot that we could go back to and build on from those early relationships. Thank you. I see no other hands up. Oh, George. The main challenge in phenotyping is not just data quality, but the data often tells us something different from what we really want, so we have to make up this algorithm to convert it. Patient data is going to be the same way. We're going to find that the reported weights are strangely different from the true weights if you were to go in with a scale and things like that. And we're just going to have to learn that and do pretty much the same process that we're doing for EHR data. We're going to have to do the same thing for patient data, and it'll just take us a little while to get there. So, so I have to say, although my job number one was to be timekeeper, that's the one thing I actually didn't do. So, Sharon, do you know where we are? I don't yeah, even have you're a copy a, you're, of the agenda. Yeah, you're, you're ahead. But we're so, an hour early. But, but we're not going to stay way ahead because we're just going to be happy. <laughs> we don't want to fill. Um, I know some people from Seattle need to leave. I, I wondered if we should take our brief break right now, unless did you have some summary slides you wanted to do for your session? You know, what I found myself uh, is I started out with the summary of um, novel and disruptive uh, elements. And it turns out it actually overlays on all the other aspects of data acquisition, analysis methods, reporting of results, and the overall process of how we do discoveries to translation. So rather than actually, if I if I start reading those, I'm actually just going to steal my thunder for all the other topics because it turns out we had something to say about nearly all of the dimensions of what eMERGE has done. So I, that's a long-winded way of saying I think it's um, that we'll let the session stand on its own merits as, as well as a rich discussion that followed. And then after the break, we'll actually begin that enumeration of um, what we think are kind of the most notable points. and. I, I make no um, representation that I've actually got the most notable of the notable points. So we're going to do this as a group editing exercise where I, I right. show you my outline of the things that I happen to highlight in red as we went through the day. And then you can uh, correct where I've done any violence to the truth or even add additional things that uh, come to mind as we go through the list. Great. So why don't we, I don't think we need 20 minutes now. I think people agree. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? Yes. I, I don't think there has actually ever been a 10 minute break in the history of Well, NIH. but if we make it a 10 minute <laughs> So we could call if, it If we 10, make it 10 minutes, then that means yeah, we'll get started that, in 15. That's right, exactly. Um, so 10 minutes, be back in 15. And then we'll be up front with a laptop to do the last session. <laughs> <laughs>